Hello, everyone, and welcome to GeoTab's Wildcard Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I'm sure you all know by now, my name is Shay Green, and I'm a Sales Enablement Manager here at GeoTab. For today's session, we're going to be hearing from Charlotte Argue, our Senior Manager of Fleet Electrification. And I'm not going to make you wait any longer, and we're going to hand things over to Charlotte to get us started. Great. Thanks so much, Shay. And I'm really glad to join everyone for today's talk. Um, so first, just a little bit of an introduction about myself. I work in the EV team at Geotab, and my role is related to EV thought leadership and providing subject matter expertise on fleet electrification. I've been with Geotab for about a year and a half, and before that, I was working in the EV industry for about a decade, mainly managing programs in British Columbia to support EV adoption and uptake. Um, that was both with fleets and with private consumers. So I've been in this industry for a while. This is a topic dear to my heart, so I'm quite excited to, to share some of this with you all. For my presentation today, we're going to go on a bit of a journey on where fleet electrification is and what it looks like today globally and really how Geotab fits in to this emerging industry. Um, but what I'm not going to do is go into any specific detail on Geotab's solutions in EV products. I'm gonna keep the, the conversation fairly high level. And the reason for that is that in two weeks, my colleague Megan will be diving into these topics at the September 30th Wildcard Wednesday. So you can think of this as whetting your appetite on the EV theme um, and getting more details on Geotab products and solutions in a couple of weeks. So with that, not necessarily knowing who is joining this call today, I thought it would be probably good to, to not make an assumption that everyone's on the same page in terms of their familiarity with EVs. So some might be very familiar and maybe consider themselves expert and some might be more new to the topic. So just to get everyone starting in the same place and footing in terms of what we mean by EV, I wanna go through some definitions. So what do we mean by an electric vehicle? Uh, there are several different types of electric vehicle technologies out there. Um, so we'll start with kind of the two most popular types or main types when you hear the term EV, and those are plug-in vehicles. So plug-in vehicles are just like the name describes, they plug into the grid to recharge their battery. And there's both pure electric vehicles, which are, are called battery electric vehicles or BEVs, and those ones only get their fuel source from electricity and from recharging their batteries from by plugging into the grid. And the second type of technology is plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And those ones also have a high voltage battery uh, and an electric motor, but they come with secondary fuel source with an internal combustion engine. And so they're also able to fuel with gasoline or in some cases, potentially diesel. Now, all plug-in hybrid electric vehicles don't come in the same form necessarily, so it depends on what maker model. Some of them, the gas only kicks in when the battery is essentially depleted. And so in that case, it's it more acts like a range extender and um, it'll kick in to recharge the battery once you've run out. Whereas other plug-in hybrids will work more in parallel, so they might uh, kick in depending on the speed that you're going with both the electric motor and the internal combustion engine. A third type of electric vehicle is the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, or FCV, and these vehicles do not plug into the grid. However, they are considered electric vehicles because their main energy source is electricity and they are only powered by an electric motor. The big difference here is the electricity source isn't from a charging cord into the grid, it's actually created on board using hydrogen. So their main fuel source is hydrogen and they have a hydrogen fuel tank on board. Now finally, a fourth type is the hybrid electric vehicle. And these ones are a bit more conventional. They've been around for longer than the plug-in electric vehicles. They do not plug into the grid. Uh, so that's an important differentiation, but they have a battery to essentially make the trips more efficient. So um, those batteries will charge up by the internal combustion engine. And often when you're going in really low speeds, it'll only use the electric motor. But industry standard today, when they talk about EVs or zero emission vehicles, generally hybrid electric vehicles are not included in the terminology or in the definition. So that's 
an important distinction to make. When we talk about our EV support at Geotab, primarily we're talking about the plug-in electric vehicles. And those are the ones that I'm going to focus on for my presentation today. So anytime I talk about EV or zero emission vehicle, I'm talking about those first two. Right, so I didn't, don't want to turn this into a physics lesson, but I thought it would be uh, helpful to just go over some terms and units that are often used when we're talking about electric vehicles. And so when you think about the fuel for a gas vehicle, you think about liters of fuel. The equivalent of liters of fuel for an EV is the volume of electricity, and that's depicted by energy, and this is kilowatt hours. So most of you are familiar with kilowatt hours because that's what you're charged um, via your utility bills generally. And I have this lovely example to go through this. So in the case of our nice rubber ducky image, the energy is essentially the water in the pool. Now battery capacity is also measured in energy, kilowatt hours, and the capacity is how much a vehicle can store. So essentially you can think of that as the size of the electric vehicle battery in the car. You can think of that with a ducky as the size of, of the ducky or how much it can hold. The level of the water in the ducky pool would be equivalent to the state of charge of a battery and that's measured in percent. So at 100% the pool is completely full, at zero it's completely empty. And then the last one is power. So it can be often confused with energy. So this, uh, this is why I like this image so much. You can think of power as the rate at which energy is added to the battery or the rate of water flowing from a hose. And generally charging stations will be sized by their power or their kilowatts. So the higher the kilowatt powered station, the faster the vehicle can charge. All right, so now that we know some of those terms, when thinking about how vehicles plug in and how they charge, there are different charging powers available out there. Low power, medium power, and fast power, they're typically called level one, level two, and DC fast charge. In North America, if you buy an electric vehicle today, every car comes with a charging cord that can actually plug into a regular outlet at home. And I say in North America, because we're on a lower voltage than elsewhere in the world, 110, 120 volt. And so we call that level one charger. It's quite slow to charge your car in this way, but for some people that's more than enough. If they don't drive a lot during the day and they park overnight, many people get away with just the level one. However, the more common charging type is level two, which uses twice the voltage, same as your oven or your dryer. And uh, they can come with multiple range of amperage as well. So that leads to from your previous slide, voltage times amps equals power. So you do get faster charging loads and power for level two. Some people have these at home. Um, for fleets, this is typical, particularly for return to base fleets that um, park overnight. And you'll also see these level two chargers at say public parking spaces such as malls or shopping centers or, or community centers. So they're good for places that you're gonna be parked for at least an hour. And then the final one is DC fast charging, and those are the highest power, and they're more equivalent to your typical fueling stations. So they're often found along highway corridors, but then for fleets who have really high utilization or fleets with large vehicles, large batteries, such as bus or transit fleets, they might use these fast chargers. I think it's really important not to think about charging in the same way you think about fueling when it comes to electric vehicles because the best time and place for vehicles to charge is when they're dwelling anyway or when they're parked anyway. And so that's why the majority of charging happens in the case of consumers at home, in the case of fleets at their fleet yard and public charging stations. There's thousands of charging stations available around the world, both level two and, and DC fast chargers, but those can be thought of more as filling the gaps from what the day-to-day -day needs are for those vehicles. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about EV market growth. So we know that over the last 10 years, EVs have started having a bit of a, a heyday. Just looking back in 2010, they barely made lip on this 
chart. And by the end of 2019, there were over 7 million vehicles on the road. So the year over year uptake has been quite substantial. Currently, globally, it's only about 2.3% of sales are electric. But as you can see, uh, this is growing quite quickly. And taking a, a bit of a future stance on this, projections of EV growth are also quite dramatic. This is from Bloomberg. So they anticipate that by the end of this year, we'll have eight and a half million EVs on the road. And that'll jump in just 10 years to 116 million by 2030. I'll say the interesting thing about these projections, depending on who's making the projection, this steepness of this curve is going to be different. But one thing that it has been common with all EV predictions is that they've all been wrong since they, they started coming out. So if you look at predictions five years ago or even three years ago, people are usually underestimating how quickly EVs are coming to market. And so this curve keeps getting steeper and steeper. But I think the, the big takeaway is this is not just a fad, not just a trend. EVs are coming and they're here to stay. So part of what's making this growth possible is the growing list of uh, vehicle makes and models available for purchase. So just in the passenger car, probably we'll think of Tesla or maybe one or two other EVs that you might be familiar with, but there are many different makes and models available. Nearly every major automaker has at least one EV available on market today. Um, many of them have very aggressive plans to bring more out in future. And the vehicles that are coming out are coming with longer range and they're coming with different options in terms of load and, and passenger size. So with the range, uh, just a comment there, the most expensive component of an electric vehicle is, is its battery. And over the last 10 years, the battery price has dropped significantly. So that's allowed these automakers to bring in vehicles with bigger batteries, but they don't necessarily have to bring up the price. So the cost is, in fact, coming down in many of these vehicles, but the range is increasing. And importantly, it's not just sedans or passenger cars that are available. We see in the market a wide range of class sizes, servicing different types of fleet needs in terms of the commercial availability. Uh, these are just seven examples of different chassis and different vehicle types that are available today um, and that are expected. But you will probably be surprised by a full list of commercial vehicles available and that are expected to come over just the next couple of years. So a really good resource here for you if you're interested in that is with CalStart. They have a zero emission technology inventory tool. I know you can't click that link right now, but if you, you Google it or um, get the link after, I recommend taking a look at that. Okay, so what does this all mean for fleets? So we certainly have seen an uptake in fleets, both commercial and, and public fleets going electric. It started really with local governments, especially with their light duty fleets, but we've seen it broaden out to a lot of transit authorities, bringing in electric buses, urban delivery companies and service providers. Electric utilities are jumping on board, uh, ride shale and the T TNC uh, industry, and a number of specialty um, areas as well. And I, I thought it'd be neat to just pull out some headlines of some fleet commitments on electric. Some of these are within the last year, some of them are within the last week. The things that sh might jump out to you, they certainly jump out to me. One is Yes, we see a diversity in terms of sectors of, of what fleets are committing to electric. But the other thing is, there's a lot of 100% here. 100% by 2030 seems to be kind of a, a point that a lot of fleets are converging to. And so we're not talking about fleets committing to pilot a few vehicles here and there. We're talking about fleets committing that in 10 years time, 100% of their vehicle purchases and their vehicles on the road will be electric. There's some nuance here. Some of these are just for the light duty fleets uh, of, of their light duty um, operations, but many of them are starting to bring in medium and heavy duty commitments as well. 
Okay, so why are we seeing fleets electrify and, and what are the main motivators? Um, so I've categorized these in four overarching themes. So the first one is corporate or internal emissions targets. And so we're seeing a lot of organizations and companies and governments commit to sustainability goals. And part of that includes a, a green fleet goal. So quite often it's top down. So the executive decides to make this decision. Maybe it's related to showing leadership or it's aligned with their brand. But more and more, we're also seeing customer and investor and even employee demand for these commitments. A second theme, and this is, you know, different parts of the world have stronger and weaker policies, but government and regulatory policies that are uh, pushing for uptake in electric vehicles. It's both related to climate targets and also local air quality targets. So we see around the world jurisdictions with vehicle incentives and charging infrastructure incentives. Um, some have tax deductions. There's many regions in Europe, particularly with low emission zones, where in order to service that area, you have to have a zero emission vehicle. And then very interestingly, governments, both at the national and subnational level, are introducing actual sales bans of gas and diesel vehicles. So right now around the world, we have 13 countries and 31 um, subnations who have brought in mandates where automakers are um, being essentially told or forced to phase out their sales of um, gas and diesel. And uh, California has kind of led this push, and most of these are for light duty vehicles. But just this year, um, the California Air Resources Board brought in the advanced truck rule, which includes a phase out of medium and heavy duty trucks. Um, so that 100% of all medium and heavy duty sales by 2045 also have to be electric. The third theme uh, for motivation is just the, uh, the business case. So electric vehicles offer fleets an opportunity to, to save money. So it makes economic sense in many cases. I mentioned that the capital costs are declining, but overall the, the total cost of ownership and the cost of operating EVs is less than your traditional diesel or, or gas vehicle. Uh, this is because they have fewer parts to break down, so there's generally less maintenance, and the cost of electricity compared to cost of fuel per, per mile or kilometer is quite a bit less as well. It's also fleet managers like EVs because the operating costs are a lot more predictable. You're not dealing with volatile oil prices jumping up and down throughout the year. And then finally, I have this uh, other category. Um, I think it's maybe overlooked sometimes when talking about fleets, but driving experience of EVs is just better. And anyone who's listening in on this who might own an electric vehicle or has driven one, they know what I mean by that. It's got instant torque, you've got really great acceleration, it's quiet, or it's smooth. So drivers tend to really like it. So you kind of get better driver satisfaction and staff retention. And EVs can also introduce new and different ways of thinking and new business models. So I've had a non-fleet example of that I thought was really interesting. So this summer with COVID pandemic around the world, most public places had to close to keep the physical distancing. And in the Netherlands, a museum decided to open up an indoor art exhibit as an EV drive through And they were able to do that because you don't have emissions coming out of these vehicles and they're quiet. There's no way they could have done something like this with gas vehicles. So it can come with your EV or you can borrow an EV and drive through this art exhibit. So just something to think about in terms of, you know, what new worlds can EVs open up? All right, so I painted a picture that EVs are great and fleets are flocking to them, but um, it's not to say that fleets don't face barriers to electrify. So just some examples of top challenges for fleets. Vehicle availability today is still not uh, ideal and depending on where you are, you might not have access to vehicles, even if they might be available elsewhere in the world. And also of the vehicles available to you, fleets have to make sure that they're capable of doing the job so that they're able to do the range and they have the payload requirements. Uh, then even though the total cost of ownership is often uh, in favorable for EVs, the upfront cost could be a barrier because you still have to justify that capital cost expenditure. 
and then you're suddenly introducing to a fleet and, and the facility managers a whole new asset with charging infrastructure. So there's costs involved in getting chargers and planning for where and how many uh, and whether or not you have the right electrical capacity. And then just it, it's a steep learning curve for fleets just getting involved. So that can also be a challenge to try to learn all this and make sure they're able to do it right. Um, as fleets scale up and bring in more EVs into their operations, they might face um, some new challenges or barriers. And that is around just making sure that they're maximizing or optimizing their assets that they've invested in and getting the most electric miles out of those vehicles. And then also, same thing with charging, making sure that they're maximizing and optimizing the electrical capacity uh, that's available to them while at the same time minimizing the costs. So how do we see Geotab's role in all this? I mean, we've seen the writing on the wall for EVs. We're all in on supporting electric vehicles. Uh, there's a great team. Um, Geotab acquired Fleet Karma, who had been working on EVs for now about a decade as well. So we've got a great team that has been working on this for many years. And the team is committed to supporting fleets as they transition to ensure that they have everything they need to be successful. So that starts with rich data and starting with making sure that we're able to pull data off of the EVs for fleets and for their insights that are needed, um, which is not as straightforward or simple as one might think because electric vehicles don't have to follow any mandatory communications protocols. So that's something that we've been really focused on. But it goes beyond just supporting the EVs. We, we really think about it as kind of a journey that fleets are going through. So the solutions that we provide really follow fleets depending, and it doesn't matter where they are in the journey. So an example of that is, you know, a fleet just getting started, they're going to have different challenges and different needs trying to figure out where best to put a vehicle into their operations compared to a fleet who might have you know, many, maybe they already have 10% of their vehicles electric and they're facing questions around, well, how do we make sure that our vehicles are charged at the right time and how do we manage the cost from charging? So along this journey, we have different solutions for fleets and this is my teaser slide because I'm not gonna go into those solutions. That's what Megan is gonna be covering in two weeks time. I will mention that on the scale electric, we're working with a number of charging station and load uh, management providers to start integrating charge management solutions so that they take into account vehicle side data in those technology solutions. And just a comment about connected vehicles and electric vehicles. The future of, of transportation in general is connected and I think it even more so with EVs. And so we can think of electric vehicles as now suddenly part of a larger system of a utility grid. And so there's a number of different technologies and energy management systems that are coming to be because of the EV industry. Things like charters, charge management, uh, we've got smart buildings. And if all of these systems are integrated, then you can really maximize and optimize those systems so that you know util this is a benefit for utilities, but it can also be a benefit for fleets. For example, potentially when their vehicles are down, they can resell some of that electricity back to the utility through signals. So there's a whole new world, um, and I won't go into too much detail here, but just to, to think about vehicles as part of a larger system. Okay, I'm going to end with just a couple of other examples of how Geotab has been involved in kind of the EV discourse. Uh, we're in a unique position with this new technology where we have a lot of EV data. And so uh, we wanted to know, you know what can we do with this data to provide more information to the public at large around the, the performance. So this is beyond just fleet use. So one tool we created was the battery degradation tool. And that was to answer a question of, well, people who are looking to invest in electric vehicles often have a question if I pay a lot of money for my EV, will, will it last or am I going to have to replace the battery in just a few years? So we created this tool by looking at the average degradation or the battery health across different EV model, makes and models. I think we have 24 in the tool 
today. Um, so you can click in and select your vehicle of choice and see what we've seen in terms of degradation trends. And kind of some of that is that um, luckily we haven't seen very significant degradation. It's been about 2.3% per year, but there's also things that you can do to slow that degradation down. So we have a blog and, and a tool online. I encourage you to look at that. And then another tool, we wanted to understand better what impact cold weather particularly has on EV range. And so to do that, we again looked at millions of trips in different temperature conditions and plotted out what the efficiency curve or the range curve would be at across different temperatures and across different vehicle makes and models. So this is a tool uh, where you can select your temperature and see what, how that impacts range. And the takeaway on this was um, the optimal range or the optimal efficiency of almost all electric vehicles is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. And that's because that's the temperature that humans like to be. So above or below, you're cranking the air conditioning or cranking the heat, and that's going to draw energy from the battery, reducing the amount of energy that's available for you um, and your range. So again, this tool is publicly available, and I encourage you to take a look at that as well. Okay, so just a couple of things to leave you with. The first thing is we have partnered with Rocky Mountain Institute on a survey of where US-based fleets are in terms of their ambition and their targets for electrification. Um, so we're really hoping that we get more fleets filling out the survey. I have the URL here, please jot this down. Even if you don't have any electrification, plans today, uh, we want to hear from you uh, because this is really just trying to get a sense of the state of fleets across different industries. And then the second point, I've mentioned this already, but please do join us in the September 30th Wildcard Wednesday to hear from Megan about our EV solutions. And then finally, if you're interested in more, we have a bunch of resources, including those two tools on geotab.com uh, under solutions and sustainability. So with that, I will hand it back to Shay for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlotte. So first question that we have for you, Charlotte, is, is it true that charging adapters are different by brand and by vehicle? Hmm. That's a, a good question. It depends on where you are and it depends on the model. But overall, for the level two chargers, all vehicles come with the same plug type. That's an SAE standard. and I want to say it depends on the model because there are some exceptions. So an exception to that is Tesla where they have their own standard, but Teslas do come with an adapter so they can use the standard that all other vehicles use. Um, when it comes to DC fast charging, there are two standards right now that are predominantly used uh, for non-Tesla vehicles and then a third standard for Tesla vehicles. Those standards are starting to converge, but any of the public, except for the very first um, installations of DC fast chargers in public, any new fast chargers come with both standards. So it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle you purchase, you'll be able to use the plug that works for your car. All right, next question we have for you, Charlotte, is what has been done in cold weather and in places with snow? It is my understanding that road salt can be very corrosive for batteries. So I haven't heard anything specific about um, road salt on batteries because my understanding is that they're actually covered. So I don't know how much salt is actually getting in the battery, but I can't answer that one. In terms of performance in snow, electric vehicles are known to perform quite well in snow because their center of gravity is lower. So they actually can handle better in many cases than a gas vehicle. And then I already covered how temperature impacts the range, um, which temperature actually impacts range for gas vehicles as well. Just people are a little less sensitive to range loss with, with fuel vehicles. But yeah, sorry, I don't have an answer specifically to the corrosive question. All right. Well, it looks like that is actually all the questions that we have for you, Charlotte. So that makes it a wrap for this week's Wildcard Wednesday. Again, a big thank you for Charlotte for joining us today, sharing the presentation and answering these couple of questions. If you guys do have any questions that 
come to mind, please don't hesitate to reach out to your reseller or your account manager, or even just to the follow-up for this session as well. We'll make sure that we get you those answers as quickly as possible. But with that being said, until next time, I'm Shay Green, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for Wildcard Wednesday. We'll see you guys next time. Same Geotab time, same Geotab channel. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.